Hey, good news. You're going to be really useful today because we're talking about joints. Um, we're classifying joints. This is the first chapter in any anatomy textbook. It's only taken me nine years to get around to. Um, we classify joints in two ways. One, what's the joint made of, which is very helpful partly because if you know what it's made of, you know what kind of diseases might occur and what can go wrong with it. But also, if you know what it's made of, you know how the joint is supposed to work, what its job is supposed to be. Um, we'll do that first. And then the second thing we can do is we can classify synovial joints by their shapes, which then helps us describe how they're supposed to move. And it gets a little bit wishy-washy, to be honest. But you'll see, we'll do the, do the big ones. Keep, keep, keep. What is a joint? A joint is a union between two or more bones. And sometimes we have joints um, that we really don't want to move. These bones are joined together and there's no movement here. Sometimes we have joints where we would like a little bit of movement, um, but not too much. We see a lot of that in the midline. And then sometimes we have joints where we would like uh, a wide range of movement, please, so that we can do the things that we need to do. Um, so the way joints are structured then gives those joints different properties. We do not all have the same number of joints and the number of joints that we have change through life. Um, when we're growing, we have growth plates in our long bones. So we have bone, cartilage growth plate, bone. That's a joint. And then after puberty, um, those growth plates close up. So there's no joints, you have fewer joints. The pelvis is initially formed from three bones and those three bones fuse and become one bone on either side. So the number of joints that we have goes down as we get older. And in fact, you can even um, age bodies by the sutures in the skull and by how much some of them have fused because it happens much later in life. Anyway, the three types of joints are fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. So a fibrous joint, um, the best example are the sutures in the skull. A fibrous joint is a joint where you have two bones and then you have loads of fibers chucked across that joint, tying the bones together. So what we see in the sutures of the skull are, we see a very wiggly interface between the two bones, like a jigsaw puzzle. And then we have fibers strung across that joint, tying those two bones together. And the aim here is to make a joint between two bones that doesn't move so that we protect the brain inside the cranial cavity. So sutures are fibrous joints. We also have fibrous joints between the teeth and um, the mandible or the maxilla, between the tooth and the bone. Um, and that joint, the gomphosis, oh, is that a great word, the gomphosis, actually has sensors in it to detect how much pressure you're creating when you're biting to limit the amount of pressure you create so you don't bite so hard you break your own teeth. Um, the other fibrous joint, um, so between the ulna and the radius, this gap here in life is filled with a fibrous sheet, a syndesmosis. And we see the same thing down here between the tibia and the fibula. This gap between the two bones is filled with a syndesmosis, a fibrous sheet. Um, so that then also supports the two bones, affects how they move in terms of these guys, because these guys move relative to one another, and also gives an attachment site for muscles to, to hang off. A syndesmosis, we can see that actually on here. So on this model of the foot, so if we cut a transverse section through the leg, we see the two bones, the tibia and the fibula, and look at that, there's a fibrous sheet in between the two bones. That is also helping create compartments, separate compartments uh, within the leg. So the syndesmosis, gomphosis, sutures, fibrous joints, not a lot of movement, often no movement. So if fibrous joints are bones held together, together by fibers, mostly of course, type one collagen, the best fiber, um, 
cartilaginous joints have a bit of cartilage in them. And it might be a hyaline cartilage, which is really, really nice cartilage, or it might be a fibro cartilage, which is kind of a cartilage with fibres in it. Um, here we've got a great example of that. So rib becomes cartilage. So that is a primary cartilaginous joint. Um, so the cartilaginous joints get divided into primary cartilaginous joints and secondary cartilaginous joints. The primary cartilaginous joint is also known as a synchondrosis. So this is an example of a synchondrosis. Bone becomes cartilage. And the other place we see this was, as I mentioned before, the growth plates in the long bones. We have bone, we have cartilage, we have bone. That's another synchondrosis. That's another primary cartilaginous joint. Um, the secondary cartilaginous joint, so the other type, is a symphysis, which might be a more familiar word to you. Down here, we have the pubic symphysis. These are the pubis bones, the pu so this is the pubic region. So we have a pubic symphysis. What we've got here is a piece of cartilage, a wedge of fibrocartilage in the midline, separating those two bones. There are loads of collagen fibers strung across to tie it all together. And that's a secondary cartilaginous joint, a symphysis. And we see examples of symphyses typically in the midline. So these are intervertebral discs. These are also secondary cartilaginous joints. Look, we've got bone, we've got cartilage, and we've got bone. And this is a fibrocartilage structure in here. Um, uh, so again, in the midline, we're seeing these symphyses, these intervertebral discs, are uh, secondary cartilaginous joints. So primary and secondary cartilaginous joints allow a little bit of movement. And with the intervertebral discs, for example, you add up all those little movements and you have quite a wide range of movement overall. Uh, the pubic symphysis allows a little bit of movement um, and in the late stages of pregnancy, hormonal changes cause ligaments to be a bit stretchier, which let the pelvis open up. It makes the pelvic bones a little bit more flexible because in humans, the birth canal is a little bit troublesome. So the symphysis pubis allows a bit of movement. So we have fibrous joints, not a lot of movement, cartilaginous joints, a little bit of movement, and then we have synovial joints, which really are a fancy form of cartilaginous joint, but they have their own category, their own classification. Synovial joints, most of the joints in the body, I think, are synovial joints, and they're the ones that allow the greatest range of movement. Um, so with a synovial joint, we have um, an articular surface. The bone is shaped in such a way to allow movement. The bone is covered in a specialized cartilage, an articular cartilage. It's like hyaline cartilage, but it's fancier. Um, it's particularly good at um, withstanding compression and what have you. Um, and then that whole joint is surrounded by a synovial joint capsule, which keeps in synovial fluid which is a lubricant that lubricates the movement. So articular cartilage is super smooth, allows a super smooth friction-free movement, and then the synovial fluid nourishes those cells and then also um, makes that movement even smoother. And then that joint is tied together again by fibrous structures, ligaments, proper ligaments that go from bone to bone, and also thickenings of the synovial capsule itself. Synovial joints, here's a knee, might also have wedges of fibrocartilage in them to support the joint in some way and stabilize it, like we have the menisci in the knee. So there's even, <laughs> yeah, you can have fibrocartilage in your synovial joints. Um, and the shape of the joint determines how it's supposed to move, and there's a trade off. The knee's an incredibly strong joint, but it only moves in one plane, it's a hinge joint. Uh, whereas the glenohumeral joint at the shoulder between the scapula and the humerus is a highly mobile joint. It's a ball and socket joint, but it's very shallow, so it's much more likely to be injured. So there's a trade-off between mobility and strength or safety of that joint. So that's a synovial joint, also known as a diarthrodial joint. If that's all you need, that's fine, you're done. If you'd like 
to know about how synovial joints are classified, let's talk about their shapes. So there are usually six classifications of synovial joint by the shapes of the joint surfaces. Uh, the hinge joint, as I've already mentioned. So um, here we have a hinge joint between the humerus and the ulna. Um, the ulna wraps around this part of the humerus, only allowing movement in one plane, so a uniaxial movement. Um, the hinge joint, we also have this at the knee. The knee is also a hinge joint, generally only allowing movement in, in one plane, so the hinge joint. And like I say, it's the shapes of the surfaces and those other, um, well, the shapes of the surfaces that define what the movement is going to be mostly, but then the other, the supporting structures, the ligaments and what have you, also play a role in that. Um, a ball and socket joint is the other end of the spectrum. So the ball and socket joint, this one doesn't work properly because it's held in with a pin instead of being a real shoulder. Um, but you have a ball in a socket and this allows movement in all axes. Okay, that one doesn't really, you know. So you have movement in all ranges, in all axes. And also you can do circumduction, so you can then put the limb in three-dimensional space. Now, the shoulder joint has actually also got a bit of fibrocartilage, a labrum ring, kind of making it a little bit deeper, but it's, it's not a very safe or sturdy joint. And of course, we've got a ball and socket joint down in the hip. And again, you can move your lower limb in all the same direction, circumduction, but you can't move it quite as far. And it's a very big joint because it's taking a lot more load than this joint. Um, it's got a deeper socket, but also it's got very strong ligaments holding the femur into the pelvis. And um, they're kind of like spiraling fibers. So as you move the, pel the, the femur in certain directions, they actually tighten up and make the joint even stronger. So it's these ligaments and the shape of the joint that allow a freedom of movement, but limit how far you can, you can move. So it's a stronger, safer joint. So those are probably the, the commonest ones. And pivot joints are fun. So again, if we look at the elbow, the joint between the, the humerus and the radius is different. Here, the radius can spin about the humerus here. So the radius actually spins at this point. So that's a pivot joint. The, the bone's moving that away. We also have the same thing up here. So the, um, the first vertebra is supporting the skull. The second vertebra has got a peg going through it and that contributes to that sort of movement, letting you say no to things. So you've got pivot joints. Pivot joints then spin. So again, clearly that's the shape of the joint, right? Plane joints are flat joints, flat surfaces that slide against one another. Um, I think the, um, the acromioclavicular joint here is a fairly good example of that. So the acromion of the scapula and the clavicle, they're quite tightly held together, but this is a mobile structure. You can move your shoulders quite a bit, the shoulder being a region rather than the joint. Um, and we have this sliding here. The other, the other classic example are the, the bones of the wrist, the carpal bones. Um, they have a lot of flat surface, flattish surfaces between them. So uh, the movements of the wrist are the combined sliding of these carpal bones to some extent over one another. Oh, the other good one is in the back. Um, so while we've got that intervertebral disc joint anteriorly, posteriorly, we have these facet joints between adjacent vertebrae. And those again are flat surfaces that, that slide. So the, the vertebrae connect with one another in multiple places. Only a little bit of movement is allowed, but those, those plane joints um, allow that sliding action. So plane, plane joints. Uh, and then we have saddle, saddle joints. So a saddle joint is where one articulating surface is shaped like a saddle. You know, you're sat on a horse like a saddle, and then the other one is kind of shaped to fit into it. 
the idea there is that it can move in two planes, it's biaxial. Um, the sternoclavicular joint is a bit like that. Um, the example that tends to get used is, here's the thumb, here's the metacarpal bone, here's the trapezium at the base of the thumb, and the joint between the trapezium and the metacarpal. So the first carpometacarpal joint is a saddle joint. Uh, so <laughs> the idea is, the thumb's complicated enough. The idea is it allows uh, movement in two planes, but it does actually allow a bit of circumduction as well. But of course, when you're moving your thumb, you, you've actually got a combination of things working there. Anyway, that's the idea behind a saddle joint. Oh, um, and the, uh, the final class is a condyloid joint. So a condyle is a knuckle. So you've got a knuckle shaped surface on one bone and then you've got the opposite shape for that. This is this joint here. So you've got the knuckle in there, the metacarpal bone. Here's your proximal phalanx. So the metacarpophalangeal joint here is a condyloid joint. If, you, if you're not seeing, if you're not imagining that, that knuckle shape, kind of shaped like a rugby ball, kind of shaped like an oval. And so you've got one knuckle and then the other bone kind of sits on it like that. And again, that, the idea is that allows uh, movements in two planes, that plane and that plane. So the condyloid joint at your metacarpophalangeal joint allows a flexion and extension of that joint and also allows, allows abduction and adduction. But you know what I mean? You add that up, you kind of got circumduction. So it's kind of like a rugby ball shaped ball and socket joint, but it's a very shallow. It's not really a socket. I didn't make the rules. I'm just describing this. So that's your first chapter in your anatomy textbook. Students don't read textbooks anymore. They tell me they Anyway, I'm getting old. They like textbooks, they don't necessarily read them. So the three classifications of joint are your fibrous joints, such as the sutures in the skull, where bones are tied together by fibrous joints. Then you have your cartilaginous joints, where you have bone meeting cartilage. You have your primary cartilaginous joints, where you have bone and cartilage. And then you have, which is a nice highline cartilage. And you have your secondary cartilaginous joints, where you have bone fibrocartilage and bone, um, which we tend to find in the midline and they get called symphyses, symphyses and synchondroses. And then you have your synovial joints, which really are fancy cartilaginous joints lined by articular cartilage, surrounded by a synovial capsule, which hold in synovial fluid, which make a joint that is hopefully gonna be freely mobile through the entirety of your life. By the way, that articular cartilage is very good at responding to load and the cells thicken up the cartilage and that's how you keep it healthy. You don't wear your joints out, you use them, you, you keep them healthy. Um, I was a cartilage biologist. Yeah, anyway, so, uh, and then you can classify synovial joints by their shapes. Hinge and ball and socket are the most common ones that we like to talk about. Pivot is fun, um, saddle and condyloid you know, and plane joints we find um, quite a few of throughout the body. But that is the classification of the anatomical joints of the body. All right. More classification stuff coming up in the future, I feel. See you next week. Mm -hmm.